All right, thank you all so much for joining me today. Um, let's just get right to it because there's a lot of you and there's a lot of things we'd like to cover today. But I would like to start um, with Masood. Um, I'd love each of you to introduce yourselves, uh, explain a little bit about who you are and uh, what your expertise is, the community you represent, and how your role intersects with just a discussion of hate crime in Wisconsin. Um, Masood, I'm gonna turn to you first, uh, take it away. All right, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for doing this uh, panel conversation, really appreciate it. Uh, I, my name is Masood Akhtar. I'm uh, originally from India. I came to this country over 35 years ago, and uh, I have been living in Madison for over 30. Just right now, my, my background is business, but I'm heavily involved with community activities. And um, this movement that we mentioned earlier uh, is the one that I started back in 2016 in response to a call from a TV station saying that there is a discussion in the, in the White House about starting a Muslim registry. Think about 9-11, what happened there. And since then, the Muslim community has gone through. We feel that in general, that Muslims have been labeled as terrorists. So one of the challenges we have, we have been going out and educating people about what Islam is and what Muslims are. And, um, we have partnered with John on some of those educational programs that we do. So we have been doing it because engagement is one of the ways we can address some of these problems. And then 2016, um, when there was a discussion about starting a Muslim registry, that's where I responded back by saying that that's a very un-American way of doing things. I gave up my Indian citizenship 25 years ago because of what this country offers. And so, at that time, I proposed that I like the idea of starting a registry that will actually bring people together, regardless of their ethnicity, color, or even political affiliation. So that's the time I made the announcement about starting a anti-hate registry. And now we call that as we are many united against hate. And we created a um, advisory board of people about 25 right now, and four of them are right here as a part of this panel, because we're all tied up to hate related issues as well. What we focus on basically is education. We believe in that, you know, engaging, talking to people and sitting down and explaining what we stand for. A lot of these things that you're seeing disappear. And there's no doubt, you know, the hate crimes against, you know, LGBT community, Muslim community, Asian American community, African, gone up significantly in the last several years. And I think that's the topic of discussion today. Absolutely. Percy Brown, I'd love to hear from you next. You're, you're muted. <laughs> that's gonna be like the 2021 thing too, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're muted. Uh, that's gonna be the title of our biography for the year. <laughs> I know, right? I, I know, I know. Well, anywho, Naomi, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, to my colleagues that sit on the UAH board. It's glad to be in the space with you uh, this evening. My name is Percy Brown Jr. I'm a native of Wisconsin, born and raised uh, right here in Madison. Uh, I've been an educator now in this area for over 17 years and have uh, worked with youth in various capacities across Dane County for about 23 years. Uh, I'm also uh, a third generation civil rights activist. Uh, my father and grandparents and his siblings uh, were part of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s in the Mississippi Delta, uh, where my grandfather led most of those initiatives under the leadership of Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, and my grandfather was an educator and my dad and his siblings were part of the first wave of blacks to integrate the all white school system in Bolivar County, Mississippi. Uh, and you talk about hate uh, you know, they were full fledged dealing with the Ku Klux Klan, uh, dealing with cross burnings, uh, dealing with the hatred that was being spewed in the classrooms, you know, each and every day, the isolation that they felt. And unfortunately, uh, as an educator right here in Dane County, there are things happening within our schools that may not necessarily fall as hate crimes, but definitely, uh, you know, real issues around hate speech, um, you know, which, you know, psychologically and physiologically impacts P 
people uh, who have to be the recipients uh, of such speech, right? And so that work is important. And to my suit's point, we really have to start there. Uh, because these unfortunate events that we're seeing in the media, uh, we have to go back to the roots of this, right? What, what's going on in the homes? Uh, what's being allowed in schools in terms of kids, you know, using racial epithets or or making, uh, you know, hated, hatred comments towards different groups of people that practice religions other than kind of your Eurocentric American Christian form of, of practicing religion. Uh, so those things are real. Uh, there's been an uptick in hate speech uh, in school systems, particularly in our suburban school districts. So I think, you know, at some point that's also worthy of conversation uh, because we have to go back to, to where this is actually being manifested. Um, and, and I do believe it, it starts in our communities at home and in schools. I'm glad you brought that up. Remind me if I forget, I want to come back to that in a bit. But for now, let's turn next to Caroline Farley. Okay, I'm Caroline Two Farley, and I'm the program director at the Linda and Jean Farley Center for Peace, Justice, and Sustainability out in Verona. Um, I've, I was born in California. My father is a, a first generation Taiwanese, and my mother is third generation Japanese American. Um, I've lived in um, Wisconsin for about seven years and before that um, mainly in white communities in Logan, Utah and Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I, I was involved a lot with the Asian American organizations in the Denver area, um, not so much in Wisconsin, but it, it um, as an Asian American woman, I definitely feel what's going on with the Asian community and reading about it every day and looking at those videos every night, which I probably shouldn't do, but it, it's, um, I guess it's just mentally draining. And um, I, I think it's good that you're focusing on this for your program. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Mentally draining is a good way to put it. Uh, John, I'd like to turn to you next. Sure. Um, I'm John Baudry. Uh, my, uh, my experience is a little different slant from everybody, I think. I was a prosecutor here in Wisconsin, a federal prosecutor for 38 years, uh, 1980 to 2017. The last seven and a half of those years, I was the United States attorney appointed by President Obama uh, to be the lead federal prosecutor. My experience with hate crimes um, as a white man growing up in Wisconsin is really from the prosecutorial law enforcement side of it. Um, and when I was US attorney, I made it my first and primary goal to make sure I went out to every community I could in the district, the 44 Western counties in Wisconsin, um, to meet with any group who might be targeted for hate crimes. Um, I've been to every mosque in the district from Barron to Janesville, Beloit, uh, with Eau Claire and Marshfield and Madison in between synagogues, uh, the Sikh Gurdwara here in Middleton after the, the shooting at Oak Creek. Uh, I met Steve Starkey because I was at his, uh, at his place doing some LGBTQ. Let's talk about aid crimes because these people, uh, those are my friends who can be targeted. Um, so, so I come at it that way. At, at each of these uh, uh, meetings, if you will, I simply tried to explain what hate crimes were I tried to build a relationship of trust before there was a hate crime. I think what we see happening, unfortunately, too often is a crime occurs, a shooting or a beating. It's clearly a hate crime. And there is no relationship between the targeted group because hate crimes, and I'll mention this again later, they're not targeting a person. If somebody attacks Percy because he's a black man, they want to send a message to, to a black community. So the idea is to build a relationship from my perspective, prosecutor leaders, police leaders need to build relationships with groups who could become targets of hate crimes before there's a hate crime. So that hopefully that's the perspective I can share with you a little bit. Um, I spent a lot of time as US attorney reviewing hate crimes numbers, trying to figure out why they were low, why they were high, what we could do um, and it's, uh, it's a very worthy task that you've taken for your, your project. Appreciate that. And last but not least, uh, Steve Starkey will turn to you. 
Hi, I'm the executive director at Outreach LGBT Community Center. I've been the director here for 15 years. Um, and I've also uh, been working uh, with gay rights, LGBT rights, uh, since I came out in 1981. So that's uh, 40 years now that I've been kind of in the trenches um, working uh, with that community. Um, I'm really glad that you're doing this uh, work because I think, uh, you know, hate crimes are on the rise. Uh, hate in the United States is on the rise. And uh, I think people really need to know uh, that it's happening and, uh, and also um, need to combat um, hate and, and hate by the violence that comes from hate. Absolutely. So a couple of you have mentioned the uptick we've seen. Um, so that kind of, it, it's a good jumping off place for me. As, as I've been going through police reports, as I've been going through charging data, um, I think there, there's a definite wave of uh, uptick in crime we saw, especially anti-Black hate crime um, last year. And so, you know, as we saw protests kind of erupt around the country in response to police violence, we're also, and what I'm seeing in these reports is a, a corresponding uptick in crime. And we're, you know, this is anything from graffiti and vandalism in parks um, with racial slurs to just attacking people um, for, for honestly no reason for, you know, whether it's someone intoxicated in a bar and, you know, there's someone else there that they dislike for some reason related to their race or their gender or ethnicity you know, there's an attack that ensues and there's just a lot, a, a lot of actions like that. And there is a definite uptick we're seeing in these reports from last year as we're reviewing them. What are you experiencing in each of your communities? What's your perspective on that? Um, I mentioned it's an uptick in uh, anti-Black crime. So Percy, I think it's natural to start with you. So Naomi, yeah, you know, the things uh, that we're seeing, you know, whether it's uh, George Floyd or, or going all the way back to, you know, Tamir Rice, um, or Trayvon Martin, uh, I'm a historian. And, and what we're seeing, uh, you know, with this anti-Black sentiment uh, is, is America. Uh, when you look at it historically, you know, I don't have to go back, you know, to the time period in which uh, Black folks were enslaved, but, you know, 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, you know, what's separate but equal, Jim Crow, and all that came with it, um, you know, the, the resurgence of, of the KKK, you know, periodically uh, in the early 20th century and the violence that came with that, but not just only inflicted on Black Americans, but the violence that has been and the hatred that has been inflicted on the Indigenous populations. Uh, and, and, and this is history that most Americans don't know because it's not part of what we teach. Um, and in order for us to, uh, to stop history from repeating itself, at some point we have to confront it. You know, even for my Asian brothers and sisters, you know, World War II, we had Japanese internment camps. And my mother was in one of those. Oh, so there you go. So, so there, there, there you go, right? Uh, you know, my, my father as, as a 12 year old had to wake up in the middle of the night to, to see a cross burning. Uh, in front of my family's home simply, you know, for fighting for their humanity. Uh, and typically when the Klan did that, uh, that was a threat to that your home was going to be bombed within 24 hours. Um, so for me, you know, I, I shake my head because it's here we go again. Uh, but then I also live in fear. Uh, it, it wears on me. Uh, it, I know it's wearing on my people. It, it trickles down into our educational systems. Uh, and there's a big push now for school systems to, to stop doing this work to bring our people together across racial lines, across socioeconomic lines, across religious lines. Uh, so I think we're in the thick of it. You know, Wisconsin, we can't separate from what's happening nationally. Uh, but again, as all of this is happening, I, I just hope that we can continue to educate, uh, keep that awareness where it needs to be, but then also moving that into action in terms of looking at policy and, and procedures to ensure that these things don't happen. You know, 
because when we see these situations of uh, law enforcement, you know, killing an unarmed black person, and we don't even have to talk about the reason, what about due process? What about equal protection of the laws, right? Which is the 14th Amendment. I don't think uh, it was in, in the nation's nature to uh, be judge and jury by execution. Um, especially when you're hearing, well, Eric Garner was only selling loose cigarettes. But then we have this narrative of people saying, well, he was breaking the law. And it's like, well, that really justifies his death. So there, there's something that we really have to confront and unpack uh, with the soul of this nation around hatred, the violence that has come with it, uh, and how it has been inflicted on multiple groups of people. So I hope that moving forward, uh, that the push, you know, to, to, to deal with the things that are being impacted by the black community, we can be walking side by side to support and, and stand alongside, you know, my Asian brothers and sisters, because now they are being the victims of hate. Those who, who practice Islam, uh, you know, those are my brothers and sisters as well. Uh, I have friends and, and, and we have to stand, you know, lock and step and with my white, you know, co-conspirators. Uh, because at the end of the day, all that we're talking about right here are human rights issues, right? If we can frame it as human rights issues, like who can argue with what we need to do to really deal with this uh, at every aspect of our nation, you know, from the laws and policies, but to the culture and climate and how we interact with each other as American citizens. Um, I do agree with Percy as far as the, um, the history. It's not taught. And so since all there's so much systemic racism in, in the way in education and the way that, that we are taught, nobody knows uh, about our history. And, and with Asians, we did have the internment camps. My mom was in the internment camp. She lived in California and was shipped off to Arkansas. And she was born here in the US, a US citizen. So these things aren't taught. And there's also the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Vincent Chin uh, death. We need to know about all these things to, to not repeat it, as Percy said. And, and I do think we, another thing Percy said is that we do need to work together. And I think so many times there's wedges between different groups and um, we just really need to work on, work on that. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that, that I see more on the policy side, you know, education piece is also very, very important. I think that's the most important thing. But then when it comes to some policy issues, it's also really critical. When the hate crimes went up against Asian American people, then the first Asian American elected here introduced a kind of resolution to condemn those kinds of attacks. It was so sad to see that no Republican signed off to that. So my problem is that, you know, this is also a piece of education that's related to policy, that if somebody believes in certain things, and even our elected officials of both parties, if they cannot come out and condemn it the strongest way possible, then it is perceived in a way that other people use it against that particular community that they are targeting. So part of the things that we are trying to do through We Are Many United Against Hate is to convey this message that hate is not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. It's a human issue, like Percy said, human rights. Lives are being lost for no reason. I think that should be part of the message as well. And we should continuously be reaching out to our elected officials of both parties to work with us and uh, take those actions necessary. I wanted to add, um, there were 44 transgender people that were murdered in the US in 2020, which was the largest number that has been on record. And it's been going up over the last few years. Um, so that's a really sobering statistic. Um, I was doing a little research before this uh, meeting. Um, I found that in late, late 2019, in Racine, there was a young black gay man that was beaten so badly that his jaw was broken and all of his teeth had to be uh, removed because of 
of his injuries. Um, the person who attacked him uh, was charged with a hate crime. Um, so that's here in Wisconsin. Um, you know, we are seeing uh, Dane County and Madison are fairly LGBTQ friendly uh, places. Um, that's not to say that there isn't uh, homophobia and transphobia that's happening in Madison. Um, our transgender clients tell us regularly that if they uh, if they ride on the city bus, that they get harassed. You know, they get harassed in public. Um, they worry about being stopped by police because if their driver's license doesn't match um, the the way that they are presenting at the time, they're at risk of being thrown in jail or you know uh, having a really negative interaction with the police. So, um, you know, it, it's a real problem and it's gotten worse over the last uh, couple of years. There's misconceptions I've found at literally every level of reporting when it comes to how the public understands hate crime, when it comes, I mean, someone just told, uh, just mentioned to me earlier today, and this is not such a misconception as a, I guess, a measurement of interest, right? They, they said, well, you know, crosses aren't burning in front yards anymore. Um, these crimes aren't the same level of seriousness. I, I, that's an interesting take um, coming as it was from a law enforcement official, um, because while crosses may not be burning in yards anymore, um, the, the reports I'm looking at are still, I mean, these are, there's still severe batteries, um, severe attacks, severe physical attack of every nature. So yes, there's a lot of vandalism, but it's not necessarily the leading or the primary cause. I mean, there, there's a professor in Eau Claire who, um, I'm not going to name, I, I, you know, we are not naming victims who aren't agreeing to be interviewed, but, you know, they were sent, they're a transgender um, individual and they, they've been handling death threats. Uh, death threats have been a prominent form of police report that I've been looking at, um, which are very severe when it comes to just the safety and mental health and understand, you know, just overall safety of an individual. Death threats are a prominent form of crime. But the thing is, the, not all these crimes are being either charged with a hate crime penalty in the courts, or perhaps on, on the flip side, police aren't recognizing them as hate crime investigations. They might have a penalty added later, but they're not responsive when it comes to, I'm looking for reports tagged with some kind of bias, some kind of hate crime. So there's that influences the data that we have. It influences what gets prosecuted. And just to mention one last fact before I shut up and let you guys contribute, um, almost half of all counties in Wisconsin over the past five years, so 2016 through 2020, never used the hate crime penalty at all, according to our analysis of that data. That's all, that's almost half of every county never used the hate crime penalty. And I don't know about you, but my guess is that doesn't mean that doesn't necessarily mean that hate doesn't exist. So I'm going to shut up there and kind of toss the ball back to whoever wants to jump in first um, when it comes to these types of misconceptions. Let me just respond briefly while everybody's getting their thoughts, uh, Naomi, um, regarding the numbers themselves. Um, this doesn't surprise me. Um, Everything I saw, and I can't say that I've been, because I, I haven't been involved in this country in the last four years since I resigned. All my work is really out of the country. But what what you see is really a, a two level disincentive to using the hate crime enhancer. The first level is the investigative burden that's perceived by the police. They are used to investigating what happened, who did it. These are why crimes. It isn't enough to, it's a simple battery if you hit somebody. It is a more complex investigation. It requires them to figure out why this person did something, what they were thinking. Um, it also requires, and the reason they're difficult, for the victim to be comfortable. And if they have no relationship, the, the transgender friends that, that Steve mentions, perhaps they, they, they don't have good relationships with the police. They don't have a feel good. And they are not comfortable explaining, this is why this happened. Um, so it, it's a several prongs that make it the police easy to go, a little easy, too easy to go, well, let's just do the crime. The second disincentive that I've always seen uh, over my career to reporting statistics is it may not be explicit, but it's certainly implicit, uh, perhaps political leadership. You don't want to be a city that reports a lot of hate crimes. Um, Madison, I give, I give Ishmael Osan and our leaders great credit. Um, because we think it does not keep people from coming here. It doesn't keep people from moving here and buying homes because we're sensitive to it and we're willing to investigate and prosecute hate crimes. 
Um, but the example I always use, you would you can check over many years and you won't find a lot of hate crimes reported uh, in Orlando. Now, I, with all the multiracial, all the people in that part of Florida working at Disney World and so on, I, I'm not defaming any of them. I'm just saying that there is an in, a disincentive to make the land around the Magic Kingdom look like it's got hate crimes. So I think the reporting is skewed, unfortunately, for those two reasons. From my view, what, what really needs to be done so we can see a true, get a true, and the numbers are horrible, but let's face it, they should be worse. <laughs> um, and the tools should be used more often uh, here and, and elsewhere. What really needs to be done, and I think Dane County is a good example of it, police and prosecutor leadership, chiefs, sheriffs, district attorneys, they need to create a culture in their organizations that makes investigating the crimes, filling out the reports, which is a little extra work, and prosecuting them makes it a priority. And I think for all of my friends in this call who, who either have been or could be victims at, at the snap of a fingers, at the very least, they should know and their communities should know that the law enforcement, prosecutor, leadership, police, chiefs, sheriffs, their leadership, they at least are sensitive and have a culture that it will uh, understand the pain and work. If you do that, then victims will speak. Then a person will say, look, it, here's what he called me. Um, he, 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 uh, I'm a black man, he used these words. Otherwise you might just look at, I just don't wanna be part of this. Just file your little charge and stay away from me. It takes courage for a victim to stand up and say, they said this about me because they perceived me as a gay man. They perceived me as transgender. And, and we need to have the police uh, and prosecutors need to encourage that courage, if you will. Well, I think another reason why some of the um, reports or people don't report crimes, especially in the Asian community, is because there's often language barriers. And there is, like John said, a, a, a big distrust or, or many um, distrust the, the police because maybe the countries they came from, the police were very corrupt there. So um, I, I think that that's one of the underreporting, at least in the Asian community. There's one more thing I always talk about when I talk with law enforcement officers, including FBI, give an example of, you know, culture also plays into this. You know, America is a land of immigrants, right? They all came from different countries. And I always give an example, you know, when I was growing up in India and what we were told when we were growing up, if you see a law enforcement officer, you run as fast as you can, okay? So when, when you grow up with that kind of culture where there's a disconnect, what those guys stand for versus this, there is an educational piece that we need to bring it during this conversation because still people who come from other countries have this kind of background and they think law enforcement office in the United States pretty much the same way initially as they were trained when they were going up. So if there is something they're saying, oh my God, nope, run as fast as you can. So that relationship that we are talking about, I think culture plays a role. And I think that's the educational piece that has to be a part of that conversation. You know, um, as John mentioned, you know, things are a little bit different here. You know, for example, Muslims, you know, month of fasting, you know, we're going through that month of fasting of 30 days. You know, we have very strong a relationship, working relationship with law enforcement here. David Mahoney, if he sees anything, you know, I'm the first one who get a call from him, whether it is 10 p.m. or midnight or whatever. Hey, Masood, you know, hey, how's your mask doing? You know, can I bring my people to make sure that everything is secure, everything is working properly? Can we have a meeting? And right away, we have a conference call with him and talk with him and get his experience and he can come and look it over. That's the kind of relationship that we need to build. The only reason to have him because we trust him and he trust our community. So that's the kind of relationship that is absolutely critical. I wanted to mention um, for LGBTQ people, um, part of the problem is that um, your civil rights depend on what zip code you live in. Um, 
in the state of Wisconsin, uh, there is a, uh, in 1982, there was a law passed for uh, housing, public accommodation and employment discrimination. It was only for lesbian and gay people. It did not include transgender people. So there are some cities and counties in the state of Wisconsin that do have transgender protection, but there's big parts of the state that don't. Um, the civil rights, the Supreme Court last summer um, made a landmark decision about civil rights for LGBT people. Um, and uh, it was the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, they determined that uh, sexual orientation and gender identity are included in that law. But that was a, an employment law. So now in the 30 states in the US that don't have uh, any, any type of LGBT uh, protections, um, employment is protected. But um, that means that uh, uh, public accommodations and housing are not protected. So it, and it, it tends to be that in uh, urban areas, major metropolitan areas, uh, there is better protection. And we uh, talk to clients that are from rural Wisconsin where there's, there's no protection, there's no uh, culture, um, the people feel very vulnerable and you know, don't have legal protection. So as John pointed out earlier, um, the hate crime is an enhancement. And so if we don't have laws that protect us, then there's nothing to be enhanced. Mm -hmm. What are some of the barriers we haven't discussed that might be specific to a community or covering all the classes that we just mentioned um, that prevent reporting or prevent perhaps justice itself? I can just mention one that I always talk about. It's all about how media plays a role into and so as the politicians. You know, the Muslim community, the biggest, biggest challenge that we have is our security. And the security is, I can just give you a quick example. You know, two years ago, my business office is in Middleton here. And if you remember there was a shooting at a business and one of my employees came to me during lunchtime. And then he said, Masood, do you know there was a shooting next door? And I said, no. But I said to him, I said, but let me tell you something what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to get out of this building until I find out who the shooter is. And he said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, this was going to happen. If shooter is a Muslim, this is what you're going to see on television and even elected official, terrorist attack. Right after that, Muslim terrorist. Right after that, Islamic terrorist. You see that the whole terrorism is tied up with your religion. And I said, if I go out, a lot of people know me outside this building. They might think Masood is a Muslim, he practice Islam, he's a terrorist, and they might shoot me. And this is a problem that we have. When shooter does similar things, you don't hear those words of terrorism and religion and those kinds of things. This to me is the biggest challenge for our community. And I think there are reports and reports of mainstream media that if this thing happens, you know, 70 times they repeat it and keep repeating it. And I think that creates a lot of problems. So part of our thing within the Muslim community is that we are continuing this educational piece, going out, talking to media, even elected officials, you know, quite often say, well, Islam hates us, okay? And these elected Muslims, women, you know, from Michigan and also from Minnesota, when you tell these people, go back home, well, that's not the America that we believe in. And it sends a very wrong message to these people who are ready to kill somebody. Here is an opportunity. And I think that's where we need to change the perception. And education is, is very critical at all levels that we need to be engaged to. I would just agree with Masood. Uh, media plays a tremendous role. And, and to his point, you know, in the event that, you know, someone is a, a shooter and they happen to be you know, black or Islamic, 
that narrative of terrorism is going to just follow and it's going to be repeated cycle after cycle, which is creating fear. But, you know, do you see the same narrative of a 19 year old white boy who goes and shoots up a school? Or was Dylan Roof, who goes into a black church, prays with people, and then kills nine black people, was he labeled a terrorist? Or did Dylan Roof or a school shooter have mental health issues? Um, and, and that narrative is being fed into our, you know, our cognitive processing. Uh, and, and that, you know, that information you know, draws how we see the world and how we see different groups of people. So to my Sue's point, you know, if that's the narrative, now you're putting my Sue's life in danger. Um, and, and so I think that there could be, you know, greater responsibility to the media to check itself, uh, to be as unbiased as possible, you know, in reporting of, of incidents like this, uh, because I, I just think it's, it's important. Yeah. Can you imagine just for a second if January 6th was carried out by a Muslim? Yeah. Oh, oh. Just think about that for a second. <laughs> this country will be completely upside down. You know, and that's the big difference right there. That's the way we feel as Muslims. That's what the people of color feel, whether they're black or brown, the way they have been targeted, the way they have been portrayed. So I think we have a lot of work to do both on the educational side of it and also on the policy side, of it, both locally, statewide, and also nationally. There's also, also been a lot of television shows um, where, you know, when there's a, uh, a terrorist incident, it's always, um, it's always from outside of the U.S. and, also, and always uh, the terrorists are Islamic or Muslim or, you know, uh, just kind of vilified in the shows as, as the evil bad guys. One can look at hate crimes and are they being prosecuted? Are the numbers being reported? Um, and, and there are ways you can deal with this. It's a systemic problem. Uh, police need to be trained, pros uh, prosecutors and police need to be leaders. But I think what we, what as a country, what we dance around, um, and, and my friends here don't dance around it, is why, why is hate on the rise? Not how it's being handled. I mean, I think after George Floyd, I, I do believe that at least some police and prosecutors around the country took a step back and tried to think, well, maybe, you know, maybe we need to reach out to the community. Maybe we need to build some bridges, which is really good. But th that doesn't actually get at the question, what, what, what is the root reason for the hate? <laughs> um, historic hate against all the groups that my four friends represent. Um, and I think one, one reason I would, my opinion is the uptick is that at least over the last several years, um, uh, it has been um, sort of a new normal. You know, obviously the, the internet fuels anger, you know, you, you, we used to call them Facebook muscles. You can say lots of strong things when you're just on Facebook. But I do think somehow, and, and I would blame the leaders of this country for the last four years, that level of hate became sort of normal. Well, this is the world we live in. It's not easy out there. Tough it up. And that's not the new normal. So I do think part of the problem is something well, well outside of the, the role of of the police and the prosecutors, and perhaps even elected officials, it's trying to decide why when a, when a black man takes a job, does a white man think he stole that job from me? Um, so similarly for any of the other, you know, whether they're LGBTQ, Asian Americans, uh, uh, Muslims, why is it us against them? Um, and, and that's really my view is where the country is sort of slid and, and that's really what we need to deal with. Um, but our, our, the, the subject that we sort of started with on the police and the prosecutors and, and the, the statistics, the police and prosecutors can play a role in this because when they, and I just will end with this, I said earlier, hate crimes are message crimes. If you attack a black man, you want the entire black community to know you're not welcome, you're not like us, leave. Or an
an American or a Muslim. But the police and the prosecutor can send an absolute different message. If they stand up and they say, we are prosecuting this as a hate crime, the message that is sent is, you are welcome. You are our brothers and sisters. We will protect you. You make us better. And I do think there's a role to be played to tamp down hate by our leaders, remembering every time they use the tool we're talking about, hate crimes, prosecutions, hate crimes, laws, every time they use that tool, they send a message to people of inclusion and protection. And I think a message of inclusion and protection keeps the haters at bay, even though they will always exist. But more importantly, the communities represented in our call realize they are protected, they are included, and they are more comfortable speaking to the police and working with the police if need be and so on. So I think we have to send a message that gets at the root of all the anger. I think we really need to focus in those two areas that he talked about, both sides, one on Mass's side and one on the law enforcement side. Absolutely, absolutely critical. You know, the, the thing that saddens me the most is that it, it reminds me about when I was seven years old, growing up, my father was teacher. He asked me, where do you want to go after you graduate? And I said, I want to go to United States of America. And he said, why? He said, that is the country that gives the freedom of speech, freedom to practice your religion and fulfill your dream. That's where I want to go. And when I came to this country 35 years ago, until a couple of years ago, I felt it that I was right when I was seven years old. But when I go to mosque now, when we congregational prayers like Friday prayers or during the month of Ramadan, when I enter into the main building and I see a person with a gun loaded while we are praying because we are now concerned about our lives. So now we have to hire these people to wait outside until we are done with several hours. And that's where the struggle is. That's not the America that we gave up our citizenship a long time ago. So we have a lot of work to do. I think things are going in the wrong direction, but I think I'm also confident that because of check and balances in this country that US Constitution provides, we can make those changes and keep this country united and a model for other countries to follow. That hope is still there and I believe in that person. I want to take the next five minutes. Let's dig a little further into solutions. Many of you mentioned media problems. As a member of the media, let's talk about practical solutions. What are the practical steps that need to happen? Well, I guess programs like what you're going to do, and I think, um, you know, the media just goes one story to the next. All of a sudden, it's just one thing, and then they forget about it, and the next thing happens, and it's just nonstop. Um, I, I think that like the investigative journalism that they actually focus on a topic so people can understand it. You know, after Atlanta shootings, I saw somebody on Facebook said, oh, all of a sudden there's uh, hate crimes against Asians. I mean, it's been happening forever, but it, they just think it's like, it's a, it's a trendy thing or something. And I think the media can, um, you know, depending on what they focus on, um, that, that would help a lot. I want to pitch it to Percy because I think it's schools. And when I read in the paper the other day in the Times that in Tennessee, they are, mind you, the state that said you couldn't teach evolution, uh, they are considering laws that will preclude schools from getting funding if they teach what I believe is the truth about American history, the good and the bad. Um, and and it, it, when we see an educational system that thinks, no, 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 let's not teach that, then you're not gonna deal with the root causes. And, and, and I would just point out, because I am also a lover of history, that one of the reasons ultimately that the Soviet Union imploded was its complete unwillingness to allow truth. Truth in teaching, truth in its history. And when, when Gorbachev opened that door, you couldn't, you couldn't shut it. Now I understand they're not, a country we're, we're idolizing. But my point is, I think education, whether it's through the media, whether it's through community groups, but the schools have to be able to teach real history. And I'd like to hear 
Percy, who's that's his business. I'd like to hear his thinking about that. Unmute yourself, brother. There you go. <laughs> John, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we definitely have a, a responsibility to teach truth, but also multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, bringing in the human family uh, and not just this, you know, one track Eurocentric dominated perspective or narrative, you know, not just around history, but in <laughs> everything that we teach. Uh, and unfortunately, that's under attack right now. Uh, when, when former President Trump banned diversity training at the federal level, uh, all under, you know, attacking critical race theory. That's, uh, that's the new thing now that uh, folks, unfortunately, from the conservative side of the fence are using to, uh, you know, push against, you know, school systems that are trying to bring in culturally responsive teaching, uh, concepts of, of social justice, you know, transforming our culture and climate so that every single student regardless of what they look like or believe, feel this sense of belonging because we know that if kids feel like they belong, that gives them the greatest shot uh, to engage in meaningful learning. So John, we are under attack right now. And this narrative around critical race theory, um, it's, it's a bunch of hogwash. Yeah, uh, there's no context behind, you know, what they're throwing out there. A lot of folks don't know, you know, critical race theory, it has its roots uh, in social science from W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and, and they don't understand that. And they don't understand that they if, if folks go back and look at the work of Dr. King, he follows the tenets of critical race theory, which is a theoretical framework to engage in social science research. Uh, it's not to indoctrinate uh, American citizens into uh, doing away with American values or doing away with the U.S. Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. It's really about bringing truth into the space uh, and really working to bring our children together because we know that's our best shot to deal with these things that we're seeing today um, whether it's you know social economic issues religious issues issues of uh, identity and, and and people you know being who they need to be um, but I agree with you John that's where the work needs to happen but we are under attack right now and it is gaining national steam I was on a panel discussion with educators in Denver um, Denver Colorado and they were like, so Percy, are you all dealing with pushback from folks, you know, mm -hmm. saying that the work that you're doing is critical race theory and, and it's Marxist and, and we're going to end up destroying America and the school board member read an email. And I'm like, oh, wow. It was almost like verbatim of an email that, that I've received mm -hmm. as an mm -hmm. educator. So I'm like, you know, are there trainings going on out here to empower mm -hmm folks to, you know, to, to uh, come at school systems to really work to dismantle this work. Um, and the work is human rights work. Uh, it's about bringing us together, not only as American citizens, but, you know, really working to, to build a belief system in each and every one of us to, to build a culture in a, in a society where it truly can be inclusive and we can value each other as part of, uh, uh, being a human being, being part of the human family. And, and you know, it's so disheartening uh, seeing what, you know, I'm seeing nationally, but also knowing that, you know, it's not, it's not violence, but it's the hate speech. And we have families that don't want schools to, to educate our children on why these things are wrong. Um, so there's something fundamentally wrong with our moral compass mm -hmm. right now as a nation. And if we don't try to find a way to, to bring that moral compass where it needs to be, um, I, you know, I worry about where we're headed as a nation. Uh, but I'm always someone who, you know, will be optimistic 
and hopeful. Uh, you have to have that in order to stay sane. Um, <laughs> but again, you know, I, I love being an educator because I do believe that that is one institution that can bring about that change. I just hope that, you know, leaders across, you know, school districts can be strong uh, when, you know, these attacks come to stop that work uh, because it is the right work to do, which eventually will uh, hopefully change what we're seeing around, you know, hate crimes. Uh, so that's kind of my, my, my spin on that. The other part of education that media can play a role is teaching these people that, okay, the biggest thing we have a freedom of speech, educating general public about there is a difference between freedom of speech and hate speech. Sometimes they just cross the bottle line and, and use the, hey, I can do all sorts of things. By the way, I don't, I don't have to put my mask on because of freedom of speech, right? To do that, but then it affects other people if you don't do that. So that has to be part of education as well. The other thing, as I mentioned earlier, the role of media is terrorist attack, right? You know, we work very closely with Neil Heinen at Channel 3000. You know, whenever he will find any case when there was a shooting, and if that was not called as terrorist, he will go on television for two minute editorial next day, and he's going to say, this shooter in Texas was a terrorist. That was a terrorist attack. So there is a role for media to come out and call that what that is. Otherwise, it's just going to be singling out only Muslim people are just terrorists and, and just terrorize the whole thing. And then that creates a problem. My last point also, sometimes politicians use this. By the way, these minorities in these countries are taking your jobs away. Okay. Now, this is a big issue because as soon as you say this, hate goes up, right? So one of the things that is important as a part of this, what we should try to do through We Are Many United Against Hate as a part of education, is start bringing some minorities' success stories to public attention and create this image that minorities are just like white people, just like other people. Whether this is an example of a business that they are doing in the community, hiring all sorts of people, or whatever that is, making a case that this is not true, that we are not taking jobs away. You know? and so this, this also creates some kind of tension uh, between different you know, people of color, uh, what's happening in, in, in our society. I think media also has been doing some good things over the last few years. Um, for example, covering the uh, police shootings uh, covering, you know, the the Asian people who have been harassed and 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 killed, um, uh, challenging uh, politicians who are saying things that are dishonest and racist, um, you know, pointing out laws that are being proposed that uh, that are unfair and discriminatory. Um, uh, the January 6th insurrection, covering that and, and uh, you know, attacks on democracy. Um, I think that the mainstream media has been doing a good job of trying to, um, you know, to, to educate people and to counter some of the, the lying and the deceit that's been going on uh, politically. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to leave you with my, you know, think about hope when I said I'm very optimistic that things are going to turn around. And here's one example I will give it to you. When I received an FBI award for starting this We Are Many United Against Hate movement, I was in a business meeting in Wasa area. And there was a vice president, there was a president of a company and his wife which I never met. White people think about this located in Wasa area. And I got a call that, hey, after your meeting, can you come and have dinner with us? And I went to their house and after three hours of conversation, everything, when I was leaving, his wife said to me, hey, Masood, I heard that you got an FBI award for starting this movement and how positive impact this is creating in our communities at all levels. And I." 
because you are the only one from Wisconsin going to Washington, D.C., receiving this award from FBI Director Christopher Wray, my husband and I will be honored to go with you, go into this auditorium, sit with your family, only to see when you receive the award. And they will take care of all their own expenses, all sorts of things. Now, think about that. Two white people, I never met them before, from a rural community, and going all the way to Washington, D.C., as I received this award. That's the America. That's where the hope is, that there are people in this country who are out there supporting you, although they never met me before, a person of color. And yet, they're willing to do that. That's where my hope is, but that's where we all want to go in that direction. And then things are going to change. I'm going to wrap this up here. Um, I appreciate all of you taking the time that you did. I think you guys have had some invaluable thoughts to add. Really appreciate the context and the perspective that each of you have brought to this. And again, I just want to thank you all for your time. All right, thank you. Thanks for doing it. Really appreciate it.